Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming back. I'm joined today by Peter Strong. So we're going to get into a little bit of online therapy and mindfulness. Uh, Peter, I can't remember if I told you this. I've actually followed you on Twitter for quite a while. Um, oh, boy. And, and so, you know, maybe one of my first Twitter follows. Uh, is, and I've always been interested and finally got around to saying, like, hey, do you want to come on the podcast and talk? Uh, so I'm really excited to be able to talk to you uh, about that. Tell people, first of all, you give you a chance to introduce yourself and say what's uh, kind of your background. Where have you come from? Sure. Yeah. So um, I'm originally from the UK, as you can probably tell from my accent. Um, I have quite a long background in actually in, in medical research and biotechnology um, and Probably, what, I think now, what about 10 years ago or so, I returned to uh, Colorado and I'm based in the Boulder area of Colorado and kind of retired from my scientific background uh, in biotechnology and now pursuing my other major parallel interest, which is mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And... Um, I've been teaching mindfulness. I've been teaching mindfulness meditation and offering mindfulness-based psychotherapy as a non-clinical alternative because there's a lot of people out there who are interested in mindfulness but want something less clinical, less treatment-based and more based on teaching practical skills that can be used you know, more empowering, more self-empowering than taking medications and and so on, or just talking about emotional difficulties. So I've been offering this service online uh, through Skype, typically, sometimes through Zoom, sometimes through FaceTime, whatever works. But Skype usually is my preferred choice. Um, And... It works extremely well. Uh, the, the online therapy is a great option for people who want to take charge of their emotional well-being. And uh, but I, my only thing I would say is it's very important that you use Skype or similar video profile so you can see each other uh, because that improves communication uh, dramatically, and that's very important, obviously. Um, uh, so that's one sort of requirement I would say that I, that I found is necessary for good psychotherapy. Um, but if you can see each other, then there's really no difference. Yeah, I mean, meeting in person, you know. It's amazing the difference I've noticed that doing a lot of online therapy. And one thing you and I have in common is uh, I I don't do it as much uh, as well didn't do it quite as much before the pandemic, but I did do it before the pandemic. And I found that there are a lot of, uh, of therapists and counselors who really had not done that at all until the pandemic hit. And now almost everyone has some experience with phone, Zoom, Skype, something. Uh, right. Particularly, there are, uh, now Now we're kind of settled back into, it just depends a little bit on the, the nature of it. Uh, some of those are not uh, HIPAA verified, but there was a relaxation of that, uh, the government-wise, even with clinical therapy, uh, because they were just like, get people therapy however we can. And now a lot of the services have developed a clinical version of it, if you if you do it, for the clinical side. And then uh, you, have, you have the non-clinical, which I want to get into the differences. But first, I was just going to say, it's been so advanced that it really is very much like being in the same room. It I've, is. I've noticed mm-hmm. with podcasting, I've formed relationships with some people who've actually become some of my best friends who we've never been in a room together, you know? In fact, we don't even live in the same state or country sometimes. (laughs) That's right. Yes. And in my case, I see people all over the world, many from the UK, but also Western Europe and as far as field as Australia, New Zealand, you name it. All you need is a good internet connection. I'd like to to get into a little bit about that when you it's it's actually part of the field of 
counseling and therapy and you know in some cases we label it different things whether it's teaching or coaching or or instruction or or whatever uh, that I, I feel like there is a an enhanced ability as more and more people are entering the field who are not in the clinical range or not offering like the medical side of, of that but they're also very highly educated and trained whereas I remember when I was going to graduate school, there was talk about that as far as like there was a big boom of life coaching, you know, and people would say like, oh, what is that really? And it was almost like a joke amongst counseling students. But as I've gotten to know, I've gravitated more and more towards people because of that practicality that you're talking about. I've had a lot more people on the show who are maybe not a clinical therapist, but are someone who does the instruction guidance Um and and talk a little bit, if you will, about what the difference is when you've used the term non-clinical therapy a couple times. Um, how do you right? It? Yeah, so you know, there's a, a big sort of divide, I would say, between what I would call a treatment-based approach and a psychological approach or an educational approach. Um, so the Treatment-based approaches are what most people are familiar with. You go to your GP, they refer you to a, a local therapist, you meet and you talk about your problems, and usually it ends up with a prescription medication. So the basic problem I have with that is that it does not empower you to take charge of your own emotional well-being. You are, in fact, taking on the role of a victim someone who, who does not have power, who then goes to and trying to get, uh, trying to get a different uh, belief system, um, but not actually working directly with your emotions. So it's a treatment-based approach, even talk therapy. Um, so most people that I see have already done that, and they're looking for an alternative because it just has not worked or they feel that nothing is really changing for them. You know, they may have a temporary relief from symptoms, um, but nothing has changed underneath. They're still anxious. They're still depressed. They're still suffering from OCD or uh, um, trauma. I work a lot with emotional trauma, PTSD. It's an interesting thing to see a couple of, of shifts in the field. I find that a lot of the therapists who I know um, have have shifted into some of the de- the approach of what you're talking about of using like emotional focus therapy or EFT. Uh, had the founder of, of, of ACT or acceptance and commitment therapy, even DBT. Some of those have gone more towards that that day to day. Here's some things that you can do and use. Um, and that seems to be the more eff- uh, effective, efficacious type of things that have even gone into some of the effective therapies. Um, one of the big shifts I've seen in this kind of field and this kind of approach is, uh, I think this is what part of what you're saying is departing or leaning away from a system that is based in pathology, that uh, oh, we're coming in and here's your symptoms and let's address that. and. Yes. You know, and, and therefore maybe we've got some stability in symptoms, uh, but then we're not really doing anything else. And I, I find that a focus on mindfulness is actually one of the most powerful things. And I'd say that transcends a little bit what type of therapy you're doing if you're with a practitioner uh, who is not focusing on the underlying emotions, trauma, and being truly, we, like we say, trauma focused. And sometimes that's just a, a way of describing and marketing a program, not to be a jerk about it, but but I see that out there to where it's like, oh, we have a trauma focus program. And it's like, do you? <laughs> do, yeah. do you address the trauma and, and ways to work with it day to day? Because if you do, great, you're trauma focused. If not, you're not so trauma focused, you know. Right. And that more more um working on the person, working through and finding ways to accommodate and and really heal. Uh, and right. Unfortunately, when we focus on pathology, it, it's not it's not going to happen a lot of times. That's right, you know. And yes, yeah, so so I mean, um, th- there may be 
rare cases where you could classify anxiety or depression or uh, and, and many of the other classic sort of uh, emotional disorders, if you like, has been um, a pathology, you know, and you need to keep an eye on that and, of course, talk to your doctor and, and so on and so forth. There are certain conditions. Oh, well, sure. But I, yeah, that I find is that. so rare. Yeah. That is really not the case for 99% of people. I, I think that, uh, yeah, it's where you look at that, and I think it's important to keep in mind that these approaches are not always mutually exclusive. I mean, I'm <laughs> I, I pretty open about this uh, on the program. I talk a lot about my own diagnostic history. Um, I have bipolar disorder. And I've noticed a powerful difference in many things uh, that I feel like go beyond just what would be described as a placebo effect when I'm on my mood stabilizer. But it's like to me, it's like so when you're in that position uh, where I need this and it works for my life and, you know, less desirable things happen if I'm not on it, then uh, but then that frees you up to do what comes next. And to me, that's the ideal is if you have a medical stabilization, it should lift you into a, a position where you can go forward. But a lot of times, yeah. you see, even with uh, those that do prescriptions, there's a lot of those medications they don't like to use. Um, That's right. You know, I know a prescriber who he will shy away from anything that is a, a benzodiazepine or a, you know, something yeah. that is, uh, you can abuse it, you can get addicted to it, and he will only use them in extreme short term if someone is, in his mind, dan in danger of killing themselves, unless they stabilize their anxiety. And that's yeah. not, I'm not a prescriber, so I, everybody out there knows I'm not giving medical advice of what to take or not take. Talk to your doctor. Um, yeah, no, I'm the same way. I don't story. want to give medical advice. That's not, not my domain. But generally, I find most people who are struggling with the anxiety, depression, trauma, and addiction as well. The thing that's totally missing, I find, in classical Western psychology, if you like, or psychotherapy, is the approach of actually helping a person develop a conscious relationship with their emotions. Trying to fix them, control them, suppress them, make them go away, distract yourself. I hate to say it, but even meditation has become often nothing more than another form of distraction, of avoidance. Let us develop a nice, peaceful, beautiful state of mind so we don't have to feel rotten. Well, that's not mindfulness therapy at all. Uh, if you are feeling anx anxious or depressed, I want to know what is going on in the mind. I will have you meditate on those emotions. I want to, you've got to look and see what is actually happening in your mind. How are you creating this? It's an accumulation of conditioned reactive habits. Mindfulness, I think, is something everyone's heard of. There's, you can go ahead and Google it out there, anyone who hasn't, and you're going to find a few resources out there. But as you put it, a lot of times we may say, oh, live in the moment. Okay, now what? What do I do with that? Yeah. Uh, meditate. Okay, once again, what do I do with that? Uh, and you're talking about a different type of approach. How would you define mindfulness in a way that's useful to people? It's a very good question, very essential. It's pivotal that uh, you really explore what is mindfulness. I mean, that you know is central. Luckily, there is a lot of material now available on the Internet, YouTube, and so on. Uh, and that's wonderful. You can get many different angles, and you need to do that to get an understanding. Mindfulness is often described as living in the present. You're right. But I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> that's the um, problem. That's the problem. And sometimes uh, that's where uh, sometimes useful interventions can become almost like a cudgel that we get beaten with. Uh, it can be frustrating to say, well, live in the moment. And, well, I'm trying, and now what? And it, if it's not working, then I feel guilty. And maybe in bad situations, someone might be making me feel guilty for like, well, why aren't you doing that? Um, yeah. And so, you know, yeah, exactly as you put it. What does that mean? How do we well, operationalize that? The strict operational definition of mindfulness is developing present-centered, conscious awareness of 
whatever it is you're focusing on in the mind, uh, which is everything. You mean, even if you're looking at a tree, you're not like looking at the tree. You're looking at your own mental image of the tree. If you're looking at anxiety, are you looking at it directly, consciously to see what is there, or are you labeling it, judging it, uh, reacting to it? The real issue, if you like, that inhibits the natural process of healing is this reactivity, this conditioned reactivity. We see it, we don't like it, and we get reactive. Either we get into a, a thought storm, you know, that's cognitive reactivity, or we get into an emotional storm of emotional reactivity, like you say, I hate being like this, I shouldn't be like this, there's self-guilt and self-shame and self-hatred and so on and so forth. Or we get into behavioral reactivity, that's the third type of reactivity, habitual reactivity, which is addiction or avoidance. As I say, of which med meditation can be a, a, a guilty party here. We're trying to escape our emotions, not develop a present, centered, conscious relationship. And the, th and the fourth type of reactivity I'll just put in on my little list there is somatic reactivity, the way the body reacts to anxiety, depression, trauma. Now, very important that you also develop mindfulness of the physical sensations and, much more importantly, the mental reactions to those physical sensations. Because if you don't, it becomes habitual and it starts to reinforce the underlying emotional suffering. Such a, a tie-in with the physicality and the, the physiology, I should say, of it, uh, yeah. especially the research they're doing more and more with trauma and how that expresses itself physically in the body. And mm -hmm. it's funny because I remember in uh, undergraduate and graduate school, hearing uh, when they would talk about multicultural approaches that one of the things that was drilled or, or at least was mentioned all the time was that, you know, non-Western cultures tend to experience physical manifestations of stress more often than, than maybe Western do. And I found that that's, no, that's bogus. Actually, we just weren't paying attention to these sort yeah. of like pain and inflammation and, you know, parasympathetic and, and sympathetic nervous system reactions that now are kind of the bread and butter of trauma research, right? To say, um, so when you say what's going on in my body, there's a focus on on that feeling. And, and some of the more effective therapies that I've seen have a lot to do with saying, you know, uh, looking at that and bridging that together. Where does my emotion reside? What's that? Where's that part of me that tells me to be avoidant and to act out an addiction that's in my chest. Okay. How can you tell? I don't know. I just feel it here and I right. feel pain here. And, and you're talking about essentially an approach of leaning towards the pain. Oh, absolutely. Pain, not pulling away. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, there's, and, and this is sort of based on what I would consider fairly common, sensible, um, scientific approaches. I mean, it's like ask yourself the question. Why does my mind create this very painful emotion of anxiety or depression or trauma? I mean, what, what's going on there? There seems to be this unquestioned uh, un, uh, assumption that somehow I'm being punished. It's being inflicted upon me. But I had to take a very different approach. I would say this is nothing more than your... Uh, mind, your bigger mind, your psyche, giving you feedback. It's saying something is broken in your conditioned reactive programming, in your habits. It's not working anymore. You've got to take something, take an approach to that that's going to help you change those habits. And that's the whole function of consciousness, hmm. central focus in mindfulness. It's the, mind, the psyche is saying, look over here. And we, we run off in the other direction is the problem. So suffering, like pain in the body, suffering is functional, we say. It's there for a reason. It's a 
feedback mechanism, just as non-suffering happiness uh, and, and is a, a feedback mechanism saying you're going in the right direction here, continue those underlying habits, if you like, are useful. They, they are leading to well-being. It's based on the principle of homeostasis. You know, just as the body tries to correct itself, you know, and, and always return to a balanced point, that's its natural state. It's the same in the mind. The mind is trying to heal that anxiety or depression. It, in fact, you could say it's already trying to heal itself. You could say it's already on a pathway of healing. But that gets interrupted by all that habitual reactivity, the avoidance, the, the aversion, the suppression, and everything else that we do to get away from our unpleasant emotions. But if you are able to stay present with them, you will find they will start to heal themselves quite effectively. So, so mindfulness is the about avoidance more the the avoidance more than the uh, more well the avoidance more than anything else. It sounds like is is what you're saying that we tend to move towards self healing unless that self healing is interrupted. That's right. The, the the natural tendency of the mind and like the body is to heal. But it's you know it's designed to do that. It has to be. That's, you can call that the operating principle of any life form. It has to be able to have mechanisms that return it back to balance and equilibrium, right? You, and, yeah, it makes sense in, in a way. Uh, it sounds like the homeostasis you're talking about can both help when we're moving in a healing direction, but also that's that that same dynamic when it comes to the habitual resistance or avoidance, you know, there's also a homeostasis there that we're trying to break. So it's almost like breaking away from one to to, to the healthy one. <laughs> yes, well, yeah, that's right. Perpetuation of habits. Um, you, you could call that a form of homeostasis, but essentially we have disengaged from the natural healing mechanisms of the body and mind and now I've become a prisoner of these conditioned habits. This is something that's very central to the Buddha's teachings. Uh, from, you know, obviously mindfulness comes, traces back to the Buddha's teachings, and he recognized this. And actually, it's a very positive model, a way of looking at the human condition. Because he was basically saying that our essential nature is positive healthy and uh, happy, you know, it's a state of happiness, is our natural state. It is only these conditioned habits and reactions that we become uh, attached to through blind attachment that are the problem. But if we can overcome those habits, if we can neutralize those habits, what's left is health and happiness. So... This in mindfulness therapy and mindfulness meditation, we look very actively for any form of suffering, and then that is our focus for meditation so because we want to facilitate healing, and that can only happen when you bring in conscious awareness. So it's the real difference then, because you, you could look at that and say, you know, the habits are the pathology or the symptoms, yeah. so it's not that we ignore them. Uh, you're not suggesting that. You're, in fact, to the opposite. You're. It sounds like what you're saying is embrace them more than if we were to focus. It's more what we do next. It's like do we have consciousness. Do we then embrace the symptoms and work with that as part of who we are and part of the healing process, or do we treat them as the whole problem itself? It, so they still exist, and you still are are promoting consciousness of those. Uh, when you promote consciousness of a habit you will find the habit will change. Mm -hmm. It will start to self-regulate. It will start to change itself. You know, um, what keeps suffering alive is when the habit cannot change. So that's... So we, we, we often... In the system of mindfulness therapy that I teach, that I've developed, 
we talk a lot about the little self and the true self, which is kind of a nice way of thinking about how the mind works. We have these two parallel processes. The little self we're familiar with, the ego, the conditioned mind, all of these accumulated habits that create suffering, you know, belief systems, reactive thinking, conditioned emotional reactions that go way back to childhood. That's all part of the little self. And it's all habit-based, it's conditioned. Now, on the other side, though, you got the true self. The true self is not conditioned. It's actually what the Buddha was talk talking about as the essential nature of the mind. It's not the content. It's the consciousness that surrounds the content. It's the space that surrounds the content. You know, the best analogy is the sky. Your, the true self is like the sky, mm -hmm. not the clouds and objects that arise and pass away. See, but we, we, we lose sight of our true self and we get stuck in our little self. We think we are the clouds. We think we are the, you know, the ugly birds or whatever that's flying through the sky. We, we become, we take on the identity of our emotions. We think we are anxious. We're not. We think we are depressed. We're not depression. We're not trauma. We're none of those things, but we, we fall into this sort of delusion. We get trapped in it. It defines our little world. It's very interesting. It's funny, as you're saying that, I'm reminded uh, sometime in the last couple of days, actually, I saw somebody just on social media had posted. It was an old interview from a couple of years ago with the actor Will Smith, or for anyone out there who's, well, everyone out there is familiar with Will Smith, right? But he was talking Ooh. about method acting and why it was challenging when he tried it. Uh, and he said that uh, as you immerse yourself into a character as an actor, one of the things that was very shaking or jarring for him was he said he realized that Will Smith was also largely a character he was playing just in his life. And it's interesting. It just tied in with what you were saying that uh, we pick up ideas and assumptions and habits and we think that's who I am. It's like, who are right. you? And we answer with our job or we answer with our hobbies or because it's challenging, I think, isn't it, to get down to that root foundation of, well, who am I in my my core self, my authentic true self. That's a little, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm a, it's actually a lot. Let me go back to the it's easier. It's a lot simpler. Yeah. You see, people think, oh, my God, I've got to do some sort of psychoanalytic thing here or highly philosophical pursuit to try and figure out who I am. And it's like, no. The, the truth is, and this is, again, what is teaching, is you are none of those things. Anything that the mind creates, that you are not. You are not the content of your mind. That's not who you are. And the evidence for that, if you like, again, trying to put it in a logical context, is that if you investigate, you, can, you will see that whatever arises in the mind, you can become aware of. You can observe it. If you're afraid, you can be aware of your fear. If you have thoughts, you can be aware of those thoughts. If you have physical sensations, you can become aware of those physical sensations. The question is, therefore, what is this thing that can become aware of all these things without, if you like, any difference? It can, whatever arises, it, it doesn't define that awareness. That's your true self. So how do we get back to our true self? For me, is by directly focusing conscious awareness on the content of mind. And this is where the meditation movement has gone a bit wrong in my view, because it's trying to create an altered state. Oh, let's push away thoughts monkey mind, they call it, and let's try and create a nice blissful state. Let's be the sky. Oh, this is wonderful. I am the sky. Ah, yes. But guess what happens? Five minutes later, the thoughts come back. The crazy monkeys come back. Your emotions come back. 
Of course they come back. <laughs> they're trying to heal, they're trying to resolve, they're trying to get back to a balance point, and we're trying to avoid them. That won't work. It's That's uh, interesting to look at. So that's where you talk about it being a, a momentary distraction that uh, doesn't really, in the long run, it's not effective. Um, and interesting, do you feel like it's a? Do you feel like it's a watered down? Is that what you're saying? Kind of version of true meditation, or would you describe it's, that differently? Uh, a lot of meditations are out there are, are not really looking at things uh, at a fundamental level. It's all based on this treatment based approach. If I just do my meditation and you know sit in my posture and you know play a nice music. Everything will be fine. It won't. Okay. <laughs> and that's why people hate meditation. I mean, and I find some people enjoy it, you know, they just enjoy it for its own merits. But a lot yeah, of it's I one mean, of the most recommended things in therapy that people don't do because uh, they find that it doesn't do much for them. It's actually very common that people come back and say, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the problem is, as with all of these things like mindfulness, what on earth is meditation? People just, you know, assume that everyone knows. We don't. You have to examine it very carefully at a fundamental level. And so in the case of mindfulness meditation or vipassana, as it's called in, in Pali, the Buddhist language, meditation is about looking at the mind. It's about developing a conscious, present-centered awareness of, oh, there is a thought, there is an emotion. Can I sit with that emotion and be totally present? Mm -hmm. In that way, you're going to help the emotion heal or the thoughts resolve, but guess what? You're going to build up that identity as your true self, the one who observes. So the more you observe, the more you become the observer. The more you become the observer, the freer you become from the content of mind and that's essential to healing if you you know it's like a parent and child is the best analogy if we if a parent starts crying as much as the baby crying and there's no no healing it's terrible chaos the parent has to stay if you like completely present with the crying baby without becoming reactive then internal wisdom can go to work see that the baby needs this nappy changed or whatever it is. Hmm. You and know? It's interesting. I heard somebody talk about this once as uh, in, in they use the term our internal parent and, and we talk about yes. our internal child, but it, we're talking about our, our internal true self or parent taking care of that. And wh one of the things that uh, he was a used to, his therapist used to have an office across the hall from me and he would always use this kind of similar analogy with uh He'd say, you take a screaming baby, and the great thing is, he said, if you'd never seen a baby before, you take a baby that is totally in meltdown, you give them exactly what they need, and they immediately, just almost immediately, you switch. It looks like a miracle. They switch to this little quiet thing uh, once they get yeah. that bottle or, or they need attention and love or they change your diaper or whatever. Um, that's just I just thought I'd throw those things out there to prove well, to the audience well, that I know how babies important. work. <laughs> no, no, yeah, exactly. You know, this, we're on dangerous ground here as, as guys talking about. <laughs> but the thing is here, and it's a very, very good analogy to be explored thoroughly, you know. Um, to be an effective parent, you know, with a crying baby, look at what you have to do, what's actually going on there. You have to become totally non-reactive totally open, totally conscious. So, and in that process, you're creating a conscious, present-centered relationship with the baby, mindfulness. In that process, discovery happens. You begin to see things that you didn't see before, you know, and you start to get little clues. You see that the nappy is wobbly. Ah! See, and that's information that we often just do not see. I mean, we go through life seeing about 1% of what's actually there. You know, the rest we just skip over. So 
That, you could say, is meditation. The parent being totally present with the baby. Meditation, that is a kind of meditation. Being completely present with your mind, with what's happening in your mind, and particularly with suffering, is meditation. That's the, the central thing. We could, I talk about bringing the true self into alignment with the little self, the true self, little self alliance. This is what's needed. You see, it's like the baby can't change its nappy by itself, can it? Mm. It doesn't have the consciousness to do that yet. Yeah. It needs a parent. Well, our emotions are just the same. Do you find then uh, that meditation is, it does not have to pair with relaxation then is what you're describing. In fact, it sounds like a very assertive, active process that you're describing. Um, right. That's a good question. Let, let me answer that. Okay. So here we are meditating on our anxiety or depression or trauma. What we're learning to do is to become less and less reactive towards that emotional pain. We get to a point here where we're able to be with that pain without suffering. We are now technically at peace in that what you call relaxed state. We are that relaxed state, being present with something that's not relaxed, that's in pain. But fundamentally, that's what it needs to heal. It has to have that connection to something that is not suffering. So... That's one way of looking at this. Um, you know, we're building, we're, we're learning to be relaxed with pain because that's how we discover how to help the pain heal. Now that, so meditation has got these two aspects to it. The passive aspect, which is that opening of consciousness, opening the mind to see what is actually there to discover what is there? What is anxiety, for example? How does it work in the mind to see it? That's, that's one aspect. of. But then the other aspect of mindfulness is active. It's the response to what you see. It's not just passively saying, oh, well, there's a crying baby. Everything changes. Buddha says so. It's okay. Just sit with that crying baby and all will be well because eventually we'll stop crying. That's not mindfulness, okay? That's not mindfulness. It, mindfulness has an active quality to it, which we te technically call compassion. Compassion is defined as the response, the active response to suffering in, to help it heal, like changing the nappy of the baby. Wow. It's... Uh... I, I wonder what your thoughts are about this. I find that sometimes the people who don't care for meditation, this active part, that sometimes even physical activity tying in with that, um, people that sit down and they ohm or whatever, not to be silly about it, but, you know, they try to focus on that. Once again, some people like it, and, and it opens the door for this. But then again, I've I've also noticed that some people, will uh they their key to mindfulness and accessing that their meditative process is going jogging or working in their garden or something that takes up a little bit of activity and actually in some way you know even gets the blood going allows them to access that part of themselves that can observe how they feel while doing something uh and i that's that's one of the ways i've learned to try to package meditation into an idea that it doesn't have to be passive and therefore people are actually trying to pursue a meditative state or a state of mindfulness. Yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, I, I kind of call those those mindfulness exercises, um, uh, exercises, you know, mindful walking, mindful eating, washing the dishes mindfully, um, driving mindfully is a great practice. Uh, these are all exercises but the, here's the question you know coming back to the sort of nuts and bolts thing here the practical stuff why are you developing your mindfulness skills the application is important and the first call for application is re resolution of suffering it's what buddha taught no one listens to him 
the Four Noble Truths, you know, is the foundation of Buddha's teaching. The first noble truth is awakening to suffering, seeing what's there, seeing the cause of it, what's going on in your mind that's creating it. The third noble truth is bringing about resolution. That's the active bit. And then implementing that in your life. That means don't fool yourself, you know. Don't, you know, try to compartmentalize your life. Oh, I'm meditating, I'm a blissful Buddhist monk right now for 20 minutes and then I go and yell at my partner. That's, <laughs> that's not, you know, understanding the fourth noble truth, the eightfold path, you know, the application of mindfulness. But so we, you know, mindfulness of breathing, for example, is a very common meditation. But I'm left scratching my head. Why are you meditating on your breath? Do you have a problem with asthma? I mean, why, you know, why are you meditating? That's not your problem. Your problem is you're scared. Hmm. You're depressed. You're, you're, you're suffering from with tremendous emotional pain. You get angry. You get stressed. That's what you should be meditating on, not the breath. Yeah. If you do and ignore that, then you're just avoiding it. That's an interesting idea because uh, a lot of times the, in the clinical realm, there's there is the focus on distraction as a technique. But but even then, uh, it's meant to be like a survival skill. If it's like a public panic attack, that's going to make it so I can't drive home or something. But but oftentimes, I think from what you're describing, it becomes the end goal. As I'll just do that because it is easier. You're... Well, they're not given any other tools, are they? You see, this is the problem. This is my criticism of the current state of, uh, that, you know, they're taught, yeah, deep breathing or whatever, breathe in a bag or this, or, you know, distract yourself somehow, turn on radio. Well, those are the temporary fixes, but they're not changing the underlying psychological process that creates a panic attack. I work a lot with panic attacks and Agoraphobia, for example, obviously, being an online therapist, people really like to uh, to come for me to me if they're suffering from agoraphobia. And, and it's one it. of the great things about the access to care that sometimes people who traditionally would not come into the office. That's right, it is, and that's that's one example. But a lot of people won't come into the office because of stigma, because of you know, sort of so the social model that I'm weak if I go and seek help mm -hmm. and sit in an office, you know, and try to look down at my shoes and feeling very awkward. That's <laughs> not. It's you know, psychotherapy should be. It's good news, not uh, right. not some sort of <laughs> illness. It should be. I want to grow. I want to get my life back. I want to get my energy back. Um, that's what it's supposed to be about, you know, and so there's generally with online therapy, there's a much, much lower resistance or barrier to entry, as we call it. Oh. And that's good. It should be accessible. That's the more, the better. Um, well, that's one of uh, the major problems with healthcare in general. And to be, to be honest, it, this, this problem with healthcare even transcends some systems that one might argue are a little better than the U.S. is, but still the access to care, whether it's practicality or finances, uh, getting in to some kind of situation where I'm getting help. Yeah, it's funny because I've noticed even just practicality of taking time off. You know, some of the more established uh, therapists or counselors or people who have been doing it for a long time, they're not working Saturday. Um, some of them do, some of them do, but, you know, or whatever. And it's like, you know, uh, am I going to take off of my work schedule? Cause an hour in therapy means at least two hours travel time and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. But yet people who do online, it's like, I have a lunch break. Yeah. I can break away for that's right. you know, 30 it's to 60 fun. minutes and just hop in my car and get my phone. I, that's right. <laughs> a lot of people do the, the, the car, if you've got a nice, you know, new car, they're a lovely environment for meditating and, and doing this work. And with a Skype phone, you know, with a, a smartphone, you can have have your session sitting in the luxury of your car in the parking lot or whatever. It's, I'd see a lot of people like that. And, of course, I work a lot with driving anxiety, another limiting factor for many people. They can't get out to see a therapist because they can't face driving. 
So um, I've had people, you know, um, you know, working with them with their driving anxiety, and they drive a block, and then we stop and park, and then we meditate on the emotions that have come up, bring about resolution of those emotions. So the the feeling, you know, they've got they've got that uh, relationship right internally. And get their power back and then drive a bit more and then stop and meditate and so on. It's a great, fun way of doing it. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things I really like. And modern technology is just astounding. It makes all this possible. It, you know, 10 years ago when I started Skype therapy, it was a bit dodgy, you know, with <laughs> whether the signal was going to hold strong long wow. enough, you know, but, but now it's, it's, it's easy. I remember one of my uh, early interviews a long time ago was with someone who was in Africa for the podcast and uh, part of an NGO that helped uh, children with trauma. And we had some weird, uh, I think it was on their side of the line, on the Skype line, they had some uh, local radio music playing. It, just, it somehow bled into our call, and I just tried to tell people to interpret it as a dramatic you know, kind of thing, as if we were listening to This American Life or something. But... Uh, yeah, so there has been quite an advance in in how effective those things can be, um, and I, I wanted to ask a little bit about some of the Buddhist principles you talk about. Do, is that something that's personal to you? As far as is it something you've studied mostly for healing purposes? Is it something that has had a philosophical or emotional connection for you? Oh yeah, I mean the Buddhist teaching. I mean, which is different than Buddhism. Okay. It's not, it's not, it's not sect based. You know, I'm not a Tibetan Buddhist. I'm not this. I'm not that. I, I just look at the, the essence of what the Buddha was teaching, and it makes a lot of sense to me. It makes a lot of sense as a scientist. I mean, the whole the whole concept of, you know, this the, what I call opening to the mystery. You know, people think you see the biggest problem. People think they know what depression is. And the medical profession is not helping. They're trying to diagnose it and, and say this is what it is, or you have this. It's not. The, if you really look at anything, all that you're left with is mystery. It, 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 it sort of opens up in, in front of you. You look at, you know, you think you understand what an atom is. Well, you look at an atom closely, you find it's got little particles inside it, electrons and protons and neutrons. Oh, yes, we know what an atom is. It's made of these, that's how I was taught, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Yes, done it. And then you start looking a little closer again. You open to the mystery. What is an electron? What are these particles? What is a proton? And then you find them. there's more particles inside those, quarks and things like that. And, and it goes on and on. The, the central thing, and this is fundamental to philosophy of Buddhist teaching or the Buddha, the more you look, the more you find that nothing has any kind of essential identity. It's, it's simply a play of phenomena arising and passing. You know, now you bring that and look at your anxiety, what happens is you start to see into the anxiety, see, it's not one thing. It's, it's got lots of little components to it. Other emotions, guilt, shame, sadness, are classic emotions. Uh, you get to see those for the first time if you look at them. You get to see reactive beliefs. Oh, I've been believing this about myself all these years, just blindly. Well, now I'm not doing it blindly. I'm looking at this belief. I'm saying, I see you believe, welcome belief. You're welcome to be there, but I'm not going to become you. And so on and so forth. So when you do that, guess what happens? The belief starts to change. You start, you know, the more you see, and this is one of the kind of mantras of mindfulness therapy, the more you see, the more things change. The more things change, the more they heal. And the principal thing to understand here, the non-pathology model that you said, everything is already 
trying to heal. It's, you know, it's, it's really, this is just basic physics again. You know, and the Buddha was teaching that in his own way. But it's like, why does water run downhill? You know, explain that to me. This is a basic law of thermodynamics. It's trying to get back to equilibrium, right? It's, it's basically resolving itself from a state of high energy in an unstable state. It's trying to get back to a stable state. That principle is homeostasis, and it operates in the mind. Anxiety is like, you know, like a fire. What happens to a fire if you don't feed it? It burns itself out. It burn out. Huh. It's, it's a fascinating and very empowering model that you're describing, and hopefully that's something that uh, everybody out there can kind of latch on to. Um, yeah. Really glad to... to be able to talk to you about it today and you shared just some really, really great things with uh, everybody. How can people find you? Where do they go? Well, it, it, I have a website. Um, it's uh, a very simple website. Uh, uh, PDM strong um, uh, dot wordpress.com. Very you know, simple website. You can go there. Um, you can Google me, of course, my name. You'll find me all over the place. <laughs> you can type in online mindfulness therapy and I'll show up all over the place. Um, <laughs> but, like uh, a natural flow to you then is what you're saying, very much like self-healing. <laughs> yeah. Anything that has the word mindfulness and, and anxiety or depression, online, Skype, you know, in, in the title and what you search for, I'm going to come up. And, you know, it just, just contact me through the contact page. Send me an email. Ask any questions. I'm very easygoing, and I love to talk about these things, and I love to help people, you know, really discover how to heal themselves. That's what we're about. No treatment. No. Huh. Heal yourself. You have the wisdom within you already with uh with all the guests that i've been having on uh, i like to ask them to plug a charity or either a charitable organization or charitable practice or uh, anything that they would suggest for people to connect with the community uh, do you have any favorite charities uh, nothing comes to mind i mean i used to support the tibetan refugee um, you know, a charity foundation at one time. That was very, very nice. I'm not Tibetan. I'm not, you know, uh, I don't follow that tradition, but they are very nice people. And I sent them a donation many years ago, and I got this lovely little letter back, you know, handwritten letter. It was lovely from a monk. So, but basically, you know, the best charity is take care of yourself and those around you, you know, open the mind and care for each other and care for yourself as the central focus. The Broken Brain. Hey everyone, just a quick note. Although I welcome your emails and tweets, I thought I would head this one off at the pass. I know that some people have asked about this and have messaged and I think someone even mentioned it in one of the reviews of the show. Um, there is such a thing as HIPAA certified or HIPAA safe or whatever you want to call it, platforms for online therapy. And I have two things I want to say about that. One of them is, is that if you are receiving therapy from a licensed medical professional uh, doing counseling or therapy, then they are required to use a HIPAA safe platform. If you're doing life coaching or you're receiving education, instruction, or skill building uh, in a non-medical setting or with from a non-medical professional, uh, as we are talking about today, that is not a requirement. Therefore, when you hear uh, Peter talk about using Skype, that's completely legal, that's completely allowed and ethical within what he is doing. It's not a medical service. Um, in fact, there is some indication that Skype is almost there. As far as the security levels, the security levels are as good, if not better, than some of the HIPAA-approved platforms. Uh, but that's a whole nother show, a whole nother thing. But um, 
anyway, but they don't uh, follow just a few of the requirements for it to be HIPAA certified. Zoom, if you purchase the clinically appropriate plan, does now have a HIPAA uh, safe, HIPAA, well, HIPAA certified. Uh, it meets those requirements as well if you buy into that plan, as most therapists do. So don't worry about what's happening if, if, if you can. As I said in the episode, I've followed Peter for years and I'm quite aware of the work that he does and feel very, very confident having him on and talking about this. His expertise and his his expertise in the way that he helps people is something that I do not hesitate to put out there and to recommend. You may have noticed that we're having a few more episodes lately, which is a lot of fun, and I'm putting some of those things out there. If you would like to receive even more bonus materials, uh, hop on over to patreon.com slash broken brain, and you'll find some things there that are fun, informational, and so forth. The Broken Brain is a member of the Core Temp Arts network of podcasts. You should go to coretemparts.com to learn more about the network and to hear some of the other podcasts. Many deal with entertainment, pop culture, trends in society, and the way that that impacts our lives. Uh, you can hear me occasionally on the show TV8 My Brain, which is all of the Core Temp Art hosts take turns talking about different television programs. I tend to hop on there and take a little bit more of a deep dive. We did one that was a psychological examination of the children's show Bluey just recently, which was a lot of fun. The Cobra Kai show that talks about uh, the, the Netflix series Cobra Kai is also one that has been commented on by the producers of that show. Um, so there's a lot of things happening over there that are quite exciting if you're into pop culture and entertainment. Thanks for being here, everyone. I'll be back in your ears again soon to uh, stretch our imaginations and our minds and also break our brains around some pretty cool stuff. Until then, bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.